So we're gonna do thing. We're gonna do a little bit different from our normal videos. Uh, we're at here at Iron Arms. Uh, shout out to Alice Lennis, he's the office. But I got Joe. What was his name? Lugo. Jay, Joe Lugo. Joe Lugo has been one of my good buddies here, buddy of mine. We've been working out here at Iron Arms for a while, and he's been around the bodybuilding game since what? How many years? Mm, I would say the late '70s, early '80s. Late '70s, early '80s. Yeah. So. A lot of people my age grew up or were motivated by like the old school pictures and videos of back in with the Arnold era, yeah, and, uh, with uh, Arnold, Lou Ferrigno, uh, Sergio, Sergio yeah. going up to like Lee Labrada, Lee Haney, all those guys, and then going into the 90s with the Mass Monster with uh, Dorian Yates, uh, Lee Priest, uh, Ronnie Coleman. Uh, what's his name? One of my favorites that no one, I always, I never hear anybody talk about. Oh, Nestor El Somebody. Oh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. That monster. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and of course, going into the 2000 era with Jay Cutler, Dexter Jackson, Phil Heath, Kai Green, those monsters. Yeah. Uh, and, but you got to see it all in person. Um, I saw, I saw, I saw, you know, like Bakersfield's had two that I remember, big title winners. Tom Touchstone of the 85, Mr. California, and then a guy named uh, Pat Matsuda, rest in peace. He was in 2001, I believe, Mr. USA. Mr. USA, and they're both from Tripro? And they're both from right around in here, you know, I mean, in this area, right? Like, yeah, Tom, I saw him from, you know, when I first started got a uh, gym membership and then later on that soon it came along and uh, yeah uh where where was the bodybuilding game at here in Vegas? um where, where were okay. the where were the big gyms the big gyms training okay well when i first got here there was like one uh a place called babes which was downtown and i never went in there but it was upstairs i believe and that's when men and women trained on separate days you know, separate days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't all live together. As a matter of fact, when we start talking, Gold's Gym was the same way. They didn't, they didn't all train together. You know, and it was a small place. Like, Pumping Irons, what made, which came out in the 70s, 77, I think. I just watched it again recently. But uh, that's what got a lot of people, like I had some, you know, guys that I roughnecked, ended up roughnecking with in the oil field. And we all sat down and watched it. Well, some of us were already lifting in the garage and stuff like that. And then we saw it and we were like, oh, wow. I look at it now and it looks kind of, you know, it wasn't as great now <laughs> as I thought it was then. Now, was it scheduled to train on different days or was it just, just like? That's how it was. No, they just, yeah, like, the, they like, didn't know the gym that. actually scheduled it. Yeah, so if you, uh, you know, Joe Gold, he had the, uh, of course, he was the founder of Gold. And his place was um, uh, in Venice, and it was real small. And if you watch Pumping Iron, the shots in that gym are from the original Golds in Venice. And uh, so, it's a, I mean, this is kind of like probably about the size of a high school gym now. Oh, you yes. know? Oh. But then he sold, he sold out. And then he sold out, and it got sold a couple times till this, these three uh, guys, Tim Kimber, uh, Pete Grimkowski, who was Mr. Who ended up being Mr. World about the time they bought it. This guy Ed Connors. Ed Connors changed the whole fitness industry. He turned it into, in my opinion, and I've read a lot here and there. But uh, Ed Connors, he had a couple homes there in the Venice area, and he started bringing guys uh, that he knew or people would send to him. You know articles or whatever uh, descriptions and he would put them in his uh he called them house guests i mean just uh, just looking back oh so over over 500 house guests he had and i don't know if you remember a guy named victor richards do you remember yeah, him yeah. he was whew, and he was kind of wild you know and gold so Joe Gold didn't really like that. That's why he kind of sold. He was getting kind of the business was getting not his thing. And uh, but this Ed Connors, he put these guys Cutler, um, Gaspari, 
um, two of the most famous, John Cena, because uh, he had a bunch of wrestlers that were coming in there, and Ultimate Warrior, and uh, then there was, and you know, L.A. What, what do you mean by house guests? You mean like literally having houses and housing them while they drive right. there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He let them stay at his pad and uh, made arrangements for them. I don't even think he charged anybody. I, I think he just liked the whole fitness game, and so and he was a whole, he was an architect. He was no like lifter too much right. or anything, but he just liked it, and he liked it was a challenge for him, and he uh, started like bringing these guys now. in, and then. You know, and he was good. He picked like so many great uh, bodybuilders just by looking, and you know, and he would bring them in, and they would do real well. I mean, Cutler, I mean, you know, four-time Mr. O, and uh, so he just started bringing these guys in, and then he had, he must have had like a little side deal with uh, Joe and Ben Weeder, which the Master Blaster, which yeah, but <laughs> we, we can debate that, but. You know, and then Ben was the head of the IPV, so there was connects there. They were out in the, I think they were out in the valley, and uh, you know, all that stuff was going on not too far away in uh, in the Santa Monica area. And that's, he, and then he started the thing where he thought, you know what, I'm going to start like I'm not charged. You know, they would come in and do photo shoots, never charge. Plus, what he did, he was like one of the first um, to. When, when like, was this? Like, um, uh, so, uh, Joe Gold sold out, I think, it was, uh, he's, the first Gold's gym was he founded in 65, so it's that long ago. And then after that, I think he sold out in around, I'm going to say 70. And then uh, Ed Connors came in around the middle 70s. So this was all going on around the middle 70s. And I think he, he was part owner of that for... 25 years, so all the way up to around 2000, you know, 2000, 2004, somewhere in there, before they got out. But um, he was the one that started building the Gold's franchise, you know, doing franchise agreements with these people that wanted to open gyms and have a, you know, Gold's gym. I mean, it was already well known by now. And so he did that. And uh, it was at, I think at his peak, they had. And I want to say over 700 locations, 25, 26 countries. So, you know, he had a he had it going on. Yeah. You know, he had a good relationship with the people. You know, the uh, the weeder group, and then he had a great relationship with the lifters. Most of them, I mean, sure. You know, you get that many people. people well, hell yeah, when you start when you start housing people, with some of the biggest names in the industry. Plus, outside of the industry, when you're talking about Johnson and stuff like that, you're getting a lot of big, big names to and eyes that you normally wouldn't have in the normal bodybuilding scene. So, yeah, that probably that blew up real quick for him. Yeah, I mean, it was a real success, and they were making more money uh, selling uh, apparel. I mean, me and my buddy went down there, uh, my training partner from here in town and uh, I believe that uh, it was probably in the mid 90s we went down there of course we're gonna buy a shirt oh, yeah I was just out the scene I, was, down, there, I was just down there for the Cali Pro and I spent 150 bucks on merch <laughs> he he got kind of became I don't know what really I guess maybe it was just kind of time for him to move on and uh, you know with three you know of them together but after that I mean, the gold's name now is not what it was, but that's not how anything is, right. you know? I mean, there's a peak, and it was really from the, uh, I would say, the 80s and the 90s. That was when it really peaked. And it's made, you know, there's a lot more people, uh, weight training and bodybuilding. It's really a popular, you know? That's so it's probably doing was, good again. What was, oh, it's, it was, trust me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that was just down there the other day, and the, the amount of space they've added to that place. And I didn't realize that they have like street merchandise, not just like you know, like everybody sees like the old old school uh, tank tops and t shirts of gold pennies. Uh, no, they got like actual like full clothing line for like streetwear to jeans, everything. They have full clothing line. The shirt that I bought, one shirt that I bought, it was like an oversized t shirt, $50. 
I bought, I bought Kayla some leggings that was $120. And so they're, they're, they've reemerged pretty hard. Yeah, and that's what I was going to ask you. Compared to then, back when you were living like in the 80s and 90s, compared to now, how many people in, because nowadays the thing about lifting, it's cool. It's the cool thing to do. Okay, it's the whole classic physique that Bumstead brought in, mm -hmm. the whole I want to get shredded or have a, uh, that's a whole other topic we you already talked about a couple days ago, but having a vacuum and posing and all of that, uh, it's a cool thing now. So like all the high school kids, all the middle school kids, the young college kids, I mean, I see like the guys that are just started lifting, they're in the mirror posing half their workout, which I, five years ago, never. you never saw one person in the gym, even the dudes who competed posing. Nope. Yeah, so what was, what, is it, what was it like compared to the population of lifters? And we, and I don't even have, you don't even have to mean serious lifters, you can just do the average gym goer back when the 80s and 90s compared to today. Well, the 80s is when, you know, I got that gym membership at, uh, well, that place is still in, uh, it's still going. There's a lot Bakersfield of Strength and Hell? Hell yeah, yeah, man. Strength they and still have the same club. equipment from the 80s, too. And so the stuff that they had, the only, they had, I think, one bicycle in there. And that was, was probably the, like the one. driven of, one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? I don't ever remember getting Produced on it, a fucking hurricane but, when you got on it? <laughs> but uh, everything in there was weights. They had a, a deadlift, wooden deadlift platform. I mean, they, like three or four of their guys got in uh, whatever, what is that, the US PFL uh, Hall of Fame for 2008, like Sam and Ken and... Uh, oh, I, I heard back then you had monsters coming out of that thing. Oh, and you know, it was, so the only machine, they had a cable stack, you know, to do crossovers and stuff like that. They had that they, one bike, they and see? they had a T-bar row, the old kind that you remember you stand yeah. on. And they had one, and pretty much everything else, they had like a number, <laughs> they had a number of uh, a bench press stations, and what was the trick too, <laughs> was they had one with real narrow, um, uprights and you know people didn't really realize that you can't take all the plates off one side and have a, a oh, you yeah, know, no. and so it would flip over and you still have that you still have people seeing people do that shit here even at normal ass gyms but uh that, that's why i wanted to bring you in and kind of interview interview or not or just have to talk, talk, talk about it is when you have uh, and again all the guys that we see talk about this are the guys we see on YouTube, okay, the old dudes, the Mila Sarkov, the uh, Dorian Yates, the guys who, who, who follow bodybuilding forever but were in the shit. I wanted to know, I kind of wanted to get your uh, uh, outlook on a fan that's followed the sport for that long and how the top influence coming down to the local level. So like, we didn't have, like back then, I mean, I'm on YouTube 24 fucking seven mm -hmm. looking at the, and, I'm, and that's also a really cool fucking thing I like about you is, um, I'm on, I'm on, I follow all the big names. I follow all the bio beauty pros. I follow all the, the news, uh, the news channels on YouTube, like the, the bodybuilding and bullshit, the Nick strength and power, all that stuff. Uh, all the, the, the big podcasts and everything like that. And when I come talk to you, you already know about it and some shit you tell me for the first time. So like, it, 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 you didn't just follow bodybuilding from back in, your, back in the 80s and 90s. You're following the top dogs now, and you're not just following them, you're keeping up to date with all the news. I mean, you were, you were, at, you were at my bodybuilding show, both, uh, both bodybuilding shows, and you knew every single fucking dude competing. So like, we compared to what we have now, we're, we're on YouTube, I can literally follow, I can YouTube, back workout and I can have a yeah yeah I can have uh, Ronnie Coleman Jay Cutler Buck, Chris Bumstead um, fucking Nick Walker any one of the newest guys or the oldest guys watch the video on their back workouts and I can model my back workout just like they do right there okay but you you guys didn't have that in the 80s and 90s well okay so I moved to Scottsdale 
um, back in the late 70s. And the only, the thing that, the only way that you kept up with any kind of bodybuilding is through the magazine. Muscle and Health. Muscle and Strength. Yep. yep. And uh, York, I forgot. And you know, they, they changed their names, but York uh, from Pennsylvania who sold plates and all that, he had, I think it was Health and Strength, something like that. I can't really remember. But so there was that. Weeder had all kinds of oh, magazines yeah, yeah. out there. And then you had Muscle Digest, Muscle Mag International. So there was there was a few. I mean there were, and you could just look on there and, and you could see their back workout, you know, whatever. Oh they put their workouts mm -hmm. in? Oh yeah. no shit. Yeah, they weren't like and they would put in their, you know, they would have advice columns. And that really carried through um um, I would say to the, I don't know, the internet didn't come out till what, the late 90s, maybe right. the early 2000s. Yeah. So you had, a, a, you just were left with that for, you know, and then uh, then we switched over and really, the, so that's how you kept up. Yeah, because I remember like the early, like, Dorian was the first one to do it with like blood and guts. Like his, well of course you had, you had pumping iron, you had, you had pumping iron. But they didn't really talk about what they did, or like routines or anything like that. They just talked about the lifestyle, what they did, how they did it, stuff like that. The first person who actually like recorded their workout was Nick, what he does. And then you had like Jay Cutler, Jake yes. Mayne. I love, wow, Jay, Jay Cutler modeled his whole bodybuilding career off a of fucking business routine. Like he had, he had DVDs coming out every month. And he would, I could sell them. Look at him now. Yeah, man, he's, he's, he's on, all the time he's on, you fucking, know? He's honest. Yeah, I like yeah. the way he is, you know. Oh, yeah. If, he, if the godfather of bodybuilding, I would say, would be not... If you're talking about bodybuilding-wise, of course, would be right. But if you're talking about just embodying pure bodybuilding, it would be Jay Cutler. I mean, the dude's insane. He lives, breathes, and eats a bodybuilding on a daily basis, and he's modeled his whole career off that. The dude's a fucking amazing. Oh, yeah. oh, so oh, my God. Yeah. The amount of... The, the amount of pots this guy, dude, has his hands in, in the business, it's not just a supplement, but oh my god, he's he, crazy. behind the scenes, he has his hands dipped in every single bot in the fitness industry. It's fucking insane. I remember when he first started doing his uh, podcast, you know. Oh yeah, the color gas? Uh-huh, and I used, you know, he had the jaywalking and some different, you know. I fucking remember shoes, jaywalking, you know? I forgot about that. And, you know, him out walking his little yeah. uh, Yorkie yeah. or whatever, yeah. you know. And uh, Jay Cutler just seemed like a, like a kind of guy that you would really like to, you know, shake hands with. Oh, hang out with, yeah. yeah. And you know the thing is, we, we were talking about, me and Matt and Julian were talking about this the other day, is um, as the whole social media thing has grown up, because he, I mean, you know, he saw a business model, model and jumped on that shit real fast. Um, the more he's been doing the social media, the more energetic and emotional, or not emotional, but uh, ch charismatic he's been. Because, remember, J Jay Culler was known for just being that bland motherfucker. Did not talk when he had nothing to say, and when he did have something to say, it was short, sweet, to the point, and there was almost no, his, his brand of humor was so fucking dry. It was awesome, and it was awesome to see that too, because all, you had all these other guys like Phil Heath, Ty Green, and everything, who just over the top did everything. Then he had Jay Cutler, and now he's on. He's doing shorts. He's super energetic on all the shorts. I'm like, this mother, this is not the same Jay Cutler I remember. He saw that, you know, we all have like attention deficit disorder. I mean, just like if we get can't in, get, get out. pizza like within 30 minutes, we're mad. Exactly. You know? Get in, get out. That's right. And I, and we talked about this. Yeah. I said, you know, I don't really. I don't really like that, but oh, it's bad. But it's addictive because, you know, I watch the kids. Like my granddaughter's ten years old, and she's it's super bad. Flip, and then I and I, man, you know, and I'm just I don't say anything, but then I find myself doing the same damn yeah, thing. Well, I'm the, like, oh, <laughs> the attention span, the, the attention span for everybody is like. Even adults is like shortened down. It's scary. Fucking twig. No, yeah, exactly. Now I see all these kids growing up with it. Before it was YouTube, okay, ten minute, twenty minute videos. Now we're now we're on thirty second to sixty second videos, and you see people getting bored of a thirty to sixty second sixty second video and swiping swiping up. 
that's that's scary as fuck. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I'm the same way. Like if I if I'm not, if I'm not captured within five seconds of a video, I'm swiping up. And I, I I talk shit about it, but I'm doing like you said, I'm doing the same shit. When I'm at I'm at work and I'm going through a 30 second video, all of a sudden, 45 minutes gone by, and I've gone through 300 companies. And it's felt like five minutes. I yeah, I had waited. I mean, I wish I had some of the time back that I did. Right. Do it. And you know, because I just sit there. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to clean up or do the dishes. Oh, like to, this, this person, this, dude, you better get ready for the day, man. This morning, I, I, this morning, I, I, I YouTube Ross Flanagan because I wanted to see is like what he looked like uh, um, at the Cali Pro compared to what he looked at the Toronto Pro. And I was looking at his video, and I saw like literally five, ten seconds of his pose routine. So I, like, so I, all of a sudden, I'm fucking 40, 40 videos in on J- Ross Flanagan's posing routine, and I can just watch one video. It, I mean, I was, I was sitting out here and you know waiting, you know, and then I was, I uh, was messing around and I wanted to hear "Hot for Teacher," man. That's that drum song. Yeah. Like, that's awesome, you know. And so I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I realize it's a goddamn short. Yep. I thought, no, nah, that pissed me off, so I had to go find, you know, like the official video for it, because it's funny. <laughs> Daily uh, Rock. But, you know, and it's like that, just everywhere you go. Um, quick. Maybe it's not like that in other states. Maybe it's, but I doubt it. Oh, I doubt it. Because they got the same phones that yep. we got, you know, and the kids are the kids. Yep. Um, but, yeah, so you, you waited for, I mean, it was the same thing. Okay, the three things that I own that I care about the most is staying today was yeah, so it was bodybuilding, it was uh motocross and music. And you No, know, you definitely can tell you were from Bakersfield. <laughs> that's right, you know. Which I lived I mean it, it's kinda the bodybuilding and motocross because I lived in LA in the seventies when motocross just took off, you know. Oh, hell yeah. Tracks On any Sunday. Yeah, that's what, and that was the documentary that blew that whole thing up, yeah. you know? And uh, so, you had to wait. I mean, you just had to have, you, you had to wait for the magazines to come out. Now, um, if we're talking about training, now we covered training-wise. Now, they, did they cover diet in those program, in those magazines? Um, yeah, diet's always been a part of the scene. Um, you know, like, it seemed to me just kind of, I was trying to, I was thinking about this, uh, and protein's always been a big protein's deal. Been protein. Chicken's and always been chicken. Yeah. Rice always been chicken, rice. rice, broccoli. I mean, I ate that. Bodybuilder diet ain't gonna ever change. No. You can add some shit here and there, but it's never gonna change. It, you cannot. You can change your workouts. You can have the science behind, back and behind everything. Like me and you talked about the other day. You can have science change. You can have workouts change. You can have theories change. Chicken and rice always gonna be fucking chicken and rice, and that's never gonna change. Oh, no. No. I, like, what I was. The funny thing I was, I was, cause that was, I was talking to my dad because my dad was also in pro body building for me, um, or and back in Bakersfield. I need to ask him if you, you know him. Fernando Duran, Chuck, he was really called Chuck. He was big old bodybuilding. I pro- if I saw him and he was around the scene back then, I probably, I probably was because you know we actually after I left Strength and Health, I went to Gold's Gym. There was two go There ended up being two Gold's Gym in Bakersfield, but. First, there was only one, just up there by uh, on F Street, where uh, Casey Steakhouse okay. was at. Oh no, shit! Yeah, and that's where uh, Tom Touchstone went, and you know it was it was nice. It was you know had more equipment than uh, what they had at you know where I was at before. The, the thing is, like, I mean, you were probably were you, were you guys in the like the whole in the equipment back then? I guess it's actually just for me. I'm kind of wondering because when I went to train to hell. They had a, a lot, you know, you know, all the chain grip equipment and shit back there. Uh, was that what you guys training on? Were you guys training on cable loaded? Like, yeah, it was cable. That was cable. But there wasn't very much. I mean, mainly you had like a leg extension, you had a leg curl, then you had uh, squat racks, the deadlift platform, then you had bench press, you know, Most benches all weights. Over there. All free weights, mostly. Because yeah. that's when, when Cybex started taking over. Um, it was in the 90s and even some of the Cybex equipment you had back in the 90s is some of the most sought after uh, pieces there is like back in the 90s or 90s and early 2000s were like 
almost the golden era of gym equipment, like machines. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I, I was talking to Tyler about collective, and some of the, like I said this, this morning, like Cybex only made certain pieces, and like that um, pin loaded uh, laying down hack squat, they only made 100 pieces of those. But yeah, but back then in the like early 2000s and stuff, they, that was the best gym equipment ever made. I think I just. I don't know if it was at these, but I think I read some about a Cybex and they said it, it might have been that one because they said there's only yeah. you know, like a hundred made. And, yeah, and, Cybex, uh, um, uh, Pernata, which is an Italian, made, uh, Italian company, um, Paramount, um, the new one is, what is it, body, uh, what's that, what's that, um, that, quite extension one in your body fuel? Body fuel? Body flex? Something flex? Something like that. Something like that. They have some really cool stuff. Uh, now they're getting into like leverage equipment to where they can put different like um, prime pr yes so like they have yeah, like meadows was yeah. Really on that prime, man. yeah but um yeah so but, like of course now that I've, now I've realized that the, everybody kind of everybody modeled themselves or their training program off those magazines basically of what the pros are doing is that kind of what it was yeah yeah it's kind of just like right now with YouTube yeah it was the same kind of thing it's just that you had to wait and then like, there's so much more information, you know, we oh. talked about this, like, it's you would never hear anybody talk about gear at all, no time, no way, even though, you know, and at least, at least now, I mean, what are you hiding? Yeah, well, that, that's the thing, when... The, I'm not saying that you come out, oh, no, but, 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 but back, oh. back, back in the, back in, like, early 2000s, or... Just even when you were doing, when like back in the '80s and '90s, up and up until like the whole Rich Piana thing and the um, Seth Rossi thing, who came out, who regularly talked about, not even they weren't even talking about gear as like a as a I'm a cool this is, I'm cool doing this. No, it was them talking about like, look guys, you're the bit the best of the best. You guys are idling. These guys are on stuff, okay? And it's not the stuff is dangerous. So don't like if you're gonna. These are the war, these are the dangers of it. These are the warnings of it. But you can't reach this for the match because you had all those guys saying, "Oh, yeah." Yeah. You had all those guys. Yeah, I have to be pros like that are top ten pros saying, "I'm not here." Right. No, the fuck you're not. But it that grew into a into like what we talked about last night into like the Boston Lloyd and then the Rich Piana bigger by the day type shit. Where like I'm a freak, I'm cool, I'm in like a, I'm a circus attraction because I'm taking so fucking much of it, and then it went into everybody started admitting it because everybody saw her calling each other out on you're taking years to say it, you're taking years to say it, rather than just everyone minding their own fucking damn business. Yeah. Then that's social media thing, and uh, now it's to the point where it is so normalized to be on here. Like, like I told you last night, I'm having kids come up to me and ask them, like, what should I take? I'm like, God, fucking no. No, 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 exactly. yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more with that. Get in there and, like, you don't go out and, you know, you're not doing, like, uh, bracket racing. And then you go out and best buy the best car just because you got the money. Exactly. And, you know, and then you got to have somebody drive it for you because you can't even drive the right. damn thing. Right, right. When, when, so. when I'm seeing when these kids are coming up and I'm seeing them. They're not eating. They, I asked them, how much are you eating? Oh, I'm eating a lot. Oh, really? How many times do you eat today? I'm eating three or four times a day. I'm like, <laughs> motherfucker, raise that up to six or seven and have the, and then increase those three or four meals by 50% carbs and by 50% protein, and then do that six or seven times a day. There, now we have your, now we have your diet covered. Now you're okay. to work. Now we have your diet covered. <laughs> now let me see your, what your training routine's like. Well, I'm doing three sets of 10 on everything. Oh, okay. So we're not even going to failure. Okay. Like and what we talked about, the mm -hmm. other, what me, you, and Julian talked about the other day is that these guys, that these kids are, well, we don't want to be, they want that class of physique. I don't want to be big. I want to be shredded, or I want to be aesthetic. I want to be aesthetic. I want to be big. I want. I don't want to be big. I want to be shredded. I want like the kids posing in the mirror. They're two weeks into the gym and they're already posing, which is not a bad thing. They love the sport. Awesome. Bring everybody they can to the sport, 100. percent But. When you do, when you do go, come into this, you have to realize that to be like a Pierce bumps up, or just to be the average dude who looks big at the gym, is you have to learn how to train the three sets of ten, three sets of, and going. I we talked about yesterday, going up guys that are in that heavier class, that guys who have been in it uh, in, in it for a long time, 
go up to these guys and teach them how to do it right. And nowadays, it's you come up to a random, you can't just go up to a random person and start talking and telling them you're doing something wrong. You get their fucking feelings. Uh -huh. But yeah, but, I mean, here at here at Iron Arms, I, I'll go up to anybody first day I met them, and I'll come up to them and tell them, and ask them. Do, do they need help and everything like that? And there are a lot of these guys are grateful. A lot of the guys will look at me and go fuck myself. But that's that another thing about new age bodybuilding is since it's so mainstream, it's I want to be shredded. I want to be not big. I want that classic physique look, which is a cool thing is what classic still brought Still big. In. Yeah, still big. You still, have to, you still have to bulk. You still have to go to failure. You still have to bust your fucking ass, but it's almost, it is a cool thing that it is mainstream now. Because back, especially when your age, bodybuilders were freaks. Like I said, babes, the women train like on Tuesday and Thursday, and I think they split Saturday or something yeah. like that, and the men, I mean, and even the original goals, it was kind of, it, it was the same way. Yeah. You know, and I didn't really change till, you know, I mean, you can look at all kinds of different activities where ladies just didn't, you know, they just didn't do it, they didn't think it was cool or didn't think it was ladylike or whatever. And now the whole new world opened to them, you know, yeah. it's just, I mean, look at them, it's great. Yeah. You know? the, what was the training style compared from now? Because now we have the, the major training style is the heavy failure back offset training style. Where you hit feeder sets, and there are different there are different ways of training. I've I've seen it even in the pro pro circuit. You have different ways of going about this, but it's almost the same concept of feeder sets to get your CNS system used to the movement. That heavy failure set going to true failure, or at least one to two reps up till failure, and then hitting that back off set, doubling the reps, lowering the weight by about 20 30 percent. Um, and hitting another failure set with a lighter weight, or utilizing the intensifier like a rest pause, like a shotgun set, like a double tap set, stuff like that. What was, what was it like compared to back then? I think it was a lot more. I think everything was a lot more basic. I mean, you know, like I didn't really think even back then that the training, the stuff in the magazine. First of all. I didn't think that was really Bertolt Fox, you know. You remember yeah, him? Real, real? Yeah, like on his, you know, work at, I figured it was somebody that was working for the magazine that was, you know. You know I always thought the same thing when I was growing up. Well, you know, like when they had like the YouTubes or, or the, the the magazines or on like um, the uh, the big uh, supplement brand, uh, the supplement brand sites where they, they post their pros workout. I always stay in my head, I'm like, yes, that's bullshit. <laughs> they got something secret they're not fucking telling me. But it's, I mean, that's really what their workouts were. It was you know, that basic. But what we didn't realize is they were going to failure on those sets that they posted. Well, you know, like, I've never really talked to you about how you did your uh, powerlifting. And, like, I don't, and I started to read the conjugate system because that's what, you know, Louis Simmons and Westside Barbell there in Ohio. That's what they kind of went, that was their thing, you know? And, uh, but I think really the training, I just think there's more information out there, but you always had some outliers uh, that, I mean, basically, bodybuilders were doing more reps, and lighter weight, just, yeah, that hasn't really changed near as much, but they have a time where they're gonna go to get, yeah, to get mass and stuff, and you know, they're trying and they're thinking more about, you know, bodybuilders, but powerlifters are more of a, but even powerlifters, you know, that's why, you know, I'd love to hear how that went, because they still do a lot of, they have dynamics, speed, yeah. so all about, these different things. When I was, like, elbow deep in the shit powerlifting, that was probably my, because when, when I'm going about something, I always want to, I almost obsess about doing that thing, or that practice of that thing, the most efficient way possible to get the most benefit with the less negatives. Okay, so trying to get everything out. So like I'll, I'll fixate on, if even bodybuilding, I'll fixate on a program or like a workout of 
did I make sure I hit every single aspect of that muscle group that I can without ruining the stimulus of fatigue ratio? And that was even worse in powerlifting because in bodybuilding you can kind of get away with it as long as you go to a failure and you're going, you're getting as much blood flow and oxygen to that area. You're just fucking. Uh, 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 just blasting that with the biggest pump possible, you can get away with it. And but with with powerlifting, you're doing so little reps with the best possible technique. I was obsessed over program. It was unhealthy. I did not. I I, I was almost got to the point where it was not fun. And um, because it, it each week, especially if you're running conjugate, which in my in my prep prep before a competition, I ran um, a, a conjugate, kind of a mix with a west side. I would always go to a top set, but and I would run it in a conjugate program to where I would be, uh, each each week I would be lowering the volume, increasing the weight, getting my, trying to still get that hyper, uh, hypertrophic effect, well, it, slowly increasing the CNS load to make sure I was able to handle you can't just go balls to the wall and power them. That's what a lot of guys a lot of guys piss me off when they I see them working out when they're power lifters. We I have a lot of it here because bodybuilding and powerlifting is almost on the same page right now where they're so fucking popular that if a dude doesn't want to be or doesn't want to diet, he just automatically says I'm a power lifter. And then just starts fucking doing going up to a one rep max every every single workout and I just I'm fucking losing my shit. But um it was trying to program myself to get as much size as possible at the beginning. And on my off season, I ran like a cube method program. I would run a one one week on my three different lifts. I would rotate it. I would have my like let's say back the week one would be hypertrophy. I'm doing a bodybuilding workout, okay. Um, and then on my bench press, I was doing explosive. So it was like eight sets of two, trying to move the weight as fast as possible. And then I would do my heavy sets, which I would usually start off like in my, I would never go below my office. I would never go, go below a five by five. And then, uh, and then I would have my accessories with every single one of those lifts. But I wasn't, I always ran like a, it was like a, a, a bro split mixed uh-huh. with the power lifting, uh, power lifting program. So I would still have a shoulder day. I'd still have an arm day. God, that pissed off power. All the power lifters are going, they pissed them off. Like, That's wrong. That's wrong. You're not supposed to be doing that. <laughs> no, that. bro. I'm not fucking squatting twice a week. That fucking hurts. Yeah. I'm not deadlifting twice a week. No. And my shoulder is about to blow out, so I'm definitely not benching twice a week. Yeah. So I, I would, I would treat like a gross lift. So my isolation, my small muscles, the shoulders, arms. Um, I would run it like body, body. Work. So like I would still get. And in my head, it was like I still, I want to be strong, but I still want to. I don't want to be too. But. I think that actually helped me in my powerlifting career by staying a lot looser and then over developing the small uh, stabilizer muscles and the secondary muscle groups that helped out with that core lift, the mm-hmm. core compound lift. I think that's what got me ahead a lot because when I was, I mean, when I was 20, when I was 22, I broke the state, uh, 2022, state national world record bench press. But before that, uh, when I ran local meets, I broke I broke the state record like four times. I broke my own state record like four times. I broke the, my own national record like three times over at NAS when they did their um, their their uh, record breaking meets. Um, and I was only 22 years old. I mean, I was benching more than the pros were guys easily. And I think it was because I treated my lot with my secondary muscle groups like a bodybuilder. I got them as big as fucking awesome. Accessory work, yeah, man. Yeah. And when I see bodybuilding power lifters programming now, um, their tricep accessory work is 100 foot press down the bands. That's it. Well, I'm doing chest twice a week, so I'm doing that twice a week. No, it just doesn't correlate. It does not work like that. Your lockout's going to be absolutely fucking awesome. But that's how I always treat it. I obsess over it. Obsessed over programming. Um, and even in power lift and bodybuilding now, that obsession has not carried over into my my, my workouts because I can structure my workouts pretty damn well just off like basic science and CMS how I work how I work. Um, that obsession is carried over into my diet now. Like it's fucks it's fucks me up, man. Oh my god. 
especially those five weeks of when I was like five weeks out when I was in prep. Oh, dude, I would be just writing. I have, I have like six, seven pages of just writing my fucking diet down, like my off-season diet, constantly. Now I kind of regret it because it's hurting my checkbook like a motherfucker. But, <laughs> but really, doing that is really the only way because if you don't do it that way, you take a bite of something, right? Or, and that's fine. I mean, yeah. but then it gets where you're taking two bites, yeah. or you know, and you're like, wow. And then you forget, yeah. you know, because it becomes a pain in your ass to write the stuff down. So you really have to be. A, I mean, it's an obsessive oh, fuck sport yeah. oh, it's, in it's, every way. What I call it, I call it is um, because I, I, almost, I call it a disease sport. <laughs> I call it a disease sport because it's like it's like a fucking chronic disease. It will fucking It'll, if you let it take a hold of you, it will fucking, it'll fuck you up. And that's something I also call long distance shooting a disease sport because you can also, you, there's so many different variables that go into, wow. that go into the success of what you're doing that you can obsess over it. Oh, constantly. There is nothing you can get from it. So you can just try to get it as best as you can in every single area. But the most important part is consistency, especially with powerlifting. It, you can't just do two days on, one day off, and fuck off. It has to be every single day, every single fucking day. Plus, you can tell right away, genetic. You got great genetics oh, for me. this. I mean, like you wouldn't be 20 years old doing the, you know, doing 475 if you didn't have some genetics. Okay. I don't care what it is, which is so. Yeah. Just like a guy that runs track, man. There's some guys that are just genetically, you know, and. Take advantage of that. Oh hell yeah! yeah. <laughs> find your find your niche and get at it. That's right. Fuck yeah! What do you what do you think about the new school bike though? As compared to well, I think that a lot of the things like we already talked about, um, they've just right. refined it a little. But it's the same. It's the same kind of stuff. Some you know, I mean, there's a lot of guys who think old like those old '90s and early 2000s bodybuilders are a lot higher caliber than bodybuilders we got today. It was different then because. Like, whatever your frame was, that's what you tried to perfect. Yeah. It was more like, and, which made it a little more difficult for yeah. them. Right, I was thinking about that, you brought that up yesterday, and I was thinking about that all last night, is back then they worked with what they had and perfected what they had. As of now, they just push that size. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, even like, I, I don't know, it was just, a week or so ago that I listened to Frank Zane. Frank Zane's got to be about 75 years old. And, you know, they were asking all but she won the O like three times. So it's hard to not just do what you think, but it, the sport changes. Any kind of judging is going to change, you know, based on public opinion, how popular it is, you know, which is I mean, every time you click on stuff, you know, people are learning more and more. And so, but the actual, like, uh, training and dieting, it was, there was a lot less information about dieting or training because you didn't know if you were getting the real, you know, you didn't exactly know, is this, you know, is this really Columbo's uh, program or is somebody filling this in and they just take, Photo shoots, yeah, you know, and then put, and you know, I mean, Arthur Jones from Florida, he's the one that invented the uh, Nautilus equipment. We had a Nautilus studio, I guess you could call it, over there by the uh, Lassens, in that somewhere right in that area of that little small oh, yeah, thing yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And so I went over there, and you know, it was like one set failure. And it's like the part that I thought where they really what people started shooting at them as time went on is, it is not. You have to warm up. Okay. Like, especially if you're strong, what, what are you just going to load up the Nautilus machine and you're just, no, no, you're not. Up. you got to warm up. Yeah, so you got those beater sets, yep. and then you're going to get, and then you're going to get to a point, the thing that was different to me, looking at Mincer, Yates, which Mincer, he kind of started going less workout, you know, less time, less yeah, time, like, less time. Yeah, like he was talking, he was doing like one workout every like four days yeah. type thing. But you gotta, I mean, 
Spencer's a great guy, him and his brother, and I've never really heard the whole full story, but I have a pretty good idea. And, uh, you know, he was fantastic. When he got screwed over in the 80 Olympia when Arnold came back and Arnold won, and I, I don't think there's very many people around that thought he should have won. No. Menser was right up there. I think Flex Wheeler was up there too. And it, it ruined Mike Menser. After he, you know, it just ruined him because he, he knew, you know. He, no, it was just for, you know, it, it was, hurt. It, it, it was hurt. just for the documentary. Yeah. It was just because Arnold was coming back. That's it. That's the only reason it was. And, it was, and he had this thing with Weeder and Joe and Ben. And I'm not saying it was fixed, but, you it's know, Menser, it really hurt Menser. And Yates yeah. brought it back. And so it, there is training to failure, um, but you have to be really, really careful. And it's, it, like, talked about this too, that, okay, you know, yeah, too many sets because you're, and I've done that before. Oh, I just want to, especially if you get a little bit stronger yeah. and you're like, oh, I'm scared. You get a little, you know, antsy about, you know, doing whatever. And so you, oh, I want to make sure that I can get this, like the opener, you know right. what I mean? Right. And you actually are hurting yourself because you get into your, you know, right. your, when we your talk, reserves. And you if, know? if you do, if you do feel like you need that many feeder sets, it's not like you have to, every feeder set does not have to be to 10 reps. I mean, if you do need, if you feel like you need that CNS prep to get up to that working weight that you're going to be doing, that you plan in your head, or that you plan in your logbook, those feeder sets don't have to be 10 reps. You literally, a feeder set can be two, three, four reps. I mean, that, when we're doing a heavy leg workout, when I was doing over, when I was doing hack squat, I had my heavy failure set was going to be six, but he doesn't know how many I was going to do it for because I haven't done it since before prep. I only did, I got up to four or five plates. I only did two reps um, before that fifth rate. It's just getting you, getting your body, that CNS system used to that working rate is very important, okay? Because when you go into a, a working set and you lift that bar up and you're like, oh, fuck, that set's probably not gonna work out in favor. If you're already, your mind yeah, is already. Exactly, and, or if you don't get that, that muscle primed and ready and stretched, uh, fully primed with blood and oxygen, you're gonna fucking hurt yourself. Just That's like, right. The structure, the man, yeah. your structure, you're gonna get hurt, yeah. you know, because you, you know, weren't really prepared for that. And yeah. then you're starting to lose energy, you know, your ability, the fuel to even do it, you yeah. know, because you, so it's, I think that's the biggest thing that social media is like kind of fucked up, is that there's so many goddamn workouts, so many fucking techniques to go battle workout, so many different programs to run that it's, it overload so someone especially is young getting into it even when i was young getting into powerlifting there were so many damn things i could try and like you said you've got to experiment or else you're never going to know what's going to work for you because my program doesn't mean it's going to work for somebody else i i 100 fucking understand it. there is a basic scientific routine that you can implement throughout all different types of programs like the failure but um, when someone went on YouTube and they have 9, 10, 30 different workout routines, or not even workout routines, but styles that they go about growing muscle or getting stronger, fuck that sucks. I'd, I'd be overloaded the first day and be like, no, fuck this amount. Yeah. I'm not interested yeah. anymore. You didn't keep me interested. You mean I have that? to try all 30 of these things to figure out what's going to work for me? And then all of them, like 99% of them are complete bullshit. I mean, that's, I think that's the worst thing that social media has done to the fitness industry is overload someone, overload someone with a whole bunch of horse shit and tell them it's true. Oh, fuck. And the supplement industry, god damn. That's even, that's an even worse topic to go about. Vince Gironde was like, there was four things that he, and you know, we're talking, he, like, this is probably, he had a little gym there in Hollywood, Studio City, and so, the guys that were training, you know, Weeder, you know, a lot of them would end up over at his place because he would t he would tell them the real deal. He was he was one of the first in bodybuilding that I remember. Not, probably not the first, but the one that I remember with the carnivore diet. He no oh, fuck yeah. steak and eggs, no egg whites, you know, not no egg white separated. Get them yolks, man. Get them yolks, and and you know, and he looked. Great. Now he was not, and his routines were like high volume, high rep, 
uh, eight by eight, I think they called it, and he looked fantastic, you know, but he had small, I mean, he wasn't, he couldn't win in bodybuilding even as time went along because he just looked, but he had a fantastic physique. And he did some shows and stuff like that. Um, but and, and he you know, did, he had four things. I don't want, you know, you gotta, you know, have the food, you know, you gotta diet right and don't eat a bunch of crap. And, you know, he was like, no, he didn't believe in squatting. He thought at that particular point in time, the glutes were overpowering the quads during that time. So he would, but he kind of took whoever, he trained McCowie, who's one of the greatest, you know, even though he didn't win any big, big shows as far as the O, there's only so many O winners. Yeah. And he was great. And he did, he, Zane came in there, Arnold came in there, and he would just, and he, there was no bullshit with him. And it was like, here's how it's gonna be. And if he, if he saw, he didn't like uh, doing a bunch of ab work, he didn't like doing a he leg found, lift. He found what worked for him. And That's he it. said, yeah, and he wanted you to look like, well, like what the, they come in. I just want to look, you know, buff and, and cut. I want to be shredded. And that's I don't what want to be he huge. wanted. I want to be shredded. Right. And, and that, that's the thing, like, um, it, my buddy Mikey, who's, who works over at Collective, you've probably seen him around here, um, he cut out all the carbs out of his diet. He cut all, he did, started doing, like, the hard form carnival thing. Um, and it, it's not full carnival. I, I, it's almost like a fucked up keto. But, um, uh, He's, it's all fats, all red meats, all all bacon, everything like that. The whole bunch of fucking fats. The dude got dropped. He, he he got bigger. He put on eight pounds. Really? Yeah, he put on eight pounds and looked full as a fucking house last time I saw him. And Mikey's always been that dude who's shredded. He's shredded all year long. He eats like a pig. He's just shredded. Okay. So uh, he dropped the carbs up the fats and the red meat and everything and got full as a fucking house. I even looked, I saw him the other day, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, what'd you, what, are you, just, you, you take a little uh, Andro or something? What the fuck's going on here, man? And he was like, no, dude, I just dropped all the carbs and started doing fats because it was easier for my, my body. It was easier for my schedule. I didn't have to fucking prep rice or anything. I just packed a fucking 12 ounce ribeye for a meal and I just ate that. I was like, no shit. I dropped carbs and up the fats and it looks like I have never worked out before. I, just get I look like I get small as fuck. I get stringy as shit. I mean, that's what I looked like four weeks out or two weeks out from the Reno show. Uh, he just I was eating whitefish, avocado, and uh, spinach, and I looked stringy as fuck. But it, it just all depends on what works for you. That's the thing. And the same thing goes goes with workout routines as well. Because so, there's some guy who liked the ball you added in with. Uh, the, having 10 to 15 reps for the feeder sets because they feel like it's increasing blood flow. They're still they're getting, they're getting actual development from it. So, again, it's, it's all about whatever fucking works for you, whatever you see that works for you. You can't tell them no. I mean, no, it's just yeah. like, you can't say they're wrong because you don't know. That part has changed. Yeah. The, the whole dieting, I mean, we've got way more in depth with the keto, and a lot of it has to do with there's not bodybuilding, but just. Uh, society in general. There's diets, Mediterranean oh, diet, God. the Atkins diet, the this, the that. You know, which a lot. They're offshoots. There's only so many basic, you know, macros. Yeah, but it's again, three, man. But, you but again, adjust them. when you're when you're in the like the pro, when you're trying to get to that next level, chicken and rice is always going to be fucking chicken and rice, and you're it never going to beat that shit. You're yeah. Never going to beat that shit. But you see, like some of these carnivores now. Oh well, I eat fruit now. It's like okay, I mean. You know, well, why? You yeah. know, were you feeling, you know, tired? Um, but uh, at any time you eat that kind of diet of carnivore, there's going to be a lot of fats because you can't get animal products, which are the, in my opinion, that's the best protein you can get. It's yeah. going to have fats in it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. well, you otherwise any, you can't afford it. Uh, yeah, if you go anything other than um, other than chicken breast and tilapia. You're gonna have fats in it. You're gonna have fats in it. That's how it is. That's how it is. Yeah. So you might as well utilize them in your uh, uh, your uh, diet plan. And that's what I did. I mean, after after we uh, got done with the show prep, I didn't change the carbs up or anything. And with again, eight ten days after the show, I was up thirty pounds. 
And the only thing I did was change out the white fish on every meal to, I added two red meat meals in a day. And then I upped my, my rice from 100 grams of rice to 125 grams of rice, gained fucking 30 pounds off that. And I'm still trying to shed that fucking water weight. <laughs> Your body was like, thank God you decided to eat. Oh my God, it was so good. He got to the point, I couldn't, uh, two, two days ago, I couldn't put my fucking socks on. Couldn't bend over. That was all bad. Yeah, that, those are the things. Training is still training. You know, there was always guys that were training to failure, but, you know, I, I always believed in that, you know, you got to know what your, what your, what your max, pretty close. You know, you got to know what it feels like to hit where you can't do no more. Oh, yeah. So that now you have a better idea Basically. where two reps in the tank are yeah. at. You know, Otherwise, you don't know. Right. It's and that's, uncomfortable. That, that's something that I've always kind of wanted to do is keep a log book. God damn it. That's a lot. That's a lot. You need I, to I hire somebody to, for that. I want, I, want to, <laughs> I want to keep a log book, but that just seems like a whole lot of fucking work during the workout. And I just want to fucking work out. What, what uh, body blows right now are you following that you're a fan of? Um, I don't really, uh, I don't follow as many of the, you know, the new cats because I feel like there's not enough distinction. They all kind of look the same to me. Like they're all like big and sometimes though you see people, you know, you see competitors that are a little bit different. That's why I kind of like the women's game because there's more variety. Yes. You know, and you, uh, which, you know, that guy Ed Connors I talked about, he was into, he brought the women's into gold. Well, yeah, the and, new, the new. And the contest, they were the first ones to start trying to bring up some uh, physique contests for the women. And, you know, there's all kinds of Hollywood people there, too. Yeah. Stallone, Keanu, Keanu Reeves trained in there, um, Mickey Roar. Oh, yeah, you know, Bill Smith. Yeah, yeah. Have you, you know who he is? He used to be an actor. Yeah. He's, he used to do a lot of westerns. He played a heavy. He wasn't like a big star, but he used to train all the time. Check him out sometime, Bill Smith. Okay. You'll see him, and he was like. And plus, you're so close to the beach, right. too. You know. I actually there. think we're. I actually think we're having a, a reemergence of a transitioning from that big dude into the. the I think we're going from, and it's been a slow transition, to the the hunk of muscle mass type guy going into a, not not straying away from muscle because, I mean, you got Samson Dowler who weighs 330 pounds right now, but going into a more, judging off a more aesthetic basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got Hottie Chupin who's now in this one with you. You got Derek Lunsford, which is the, Jesus Christ. And that was his first, that was his like, first, oh, that like, was his open other o, than, first open o. right. Yeah. That, and it he was got, 212s or something like that before? He was 212, yeah. He had, he had the, I don't know how the fuck he got down to 212, but I guess it was rough for him to do it. It was rough for him to do it. And then you said, and then um, he came in flat. Those those years that he competed in that last time he competed in 212, even though that motherfucker looked around as a fucking house, he came, that was him flat. So when he came into the O, he just, and that was only a half year of prep because he was still prepping to be in 212. So they, they didn't even prep him for the O to be an open. This year is going to be fucking insane. So Who's his coach? Anybody? Honey Rumba. Honey Rumba, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's probably, he's. I think he might be considered, oh, dude. you know, the best He's the best coach ever, ever, yeah, ever, ever, by far. And then, um, yeah, so you have Hottie Chupin, who's also coached for Honey Rumba. You have uh, uh, Derek Lunsford, third place, of course, Nick Walker, freaking fucking nature. Um, and then you have another guy coming up, Samson Dowda. Samson Dowda, who just won the Arnold Olympia, or the Olympia, sorry, the Arnold, um, he's probably the most symmetrical dude in the game right now with that size. I'm gonna have to check him out a little bit closer, because I remember seeing him, but there were so many of them kind of coming out, which they had a pretty good, good yeah, lineup, yeah, you yeah, know, because there for a while, it was gonna wear, oh man, you know. I, I thought, we thought bodybuilding was gonna fall, fall off the fucking mat. Well, I thought it for sure was gonna go 212 in classic. Yeah, we yeah. Thought, oh, I thought open bodybuilding was gonna fall off the fucking mat mm-hmm. for a second. And then all of a sudden, within like that, that like where it got to like the worst, where like we were we were asking like, where the fuck are all these competitors at? Uh, and the shows, like we had like super, super thin lineups to, holy shit, we have like two dozen new cats coming out on the scene 
there all could be Olympia, Mr. Olympia, in the next two or three years. Huge dudes. You got good Andrew Vito. Jack. You got Andrew Jack, good Vito, uh, uh, Michael Prizzo. Uh, we were just talking about uh, uh, Samson Dowda, Derek Lunsford. You have a whole bunch of dudes. And do you still, I don't, in the, in the 212, I don't know if you keep looking at 212. 212 has a lot of competitors too. They're smaller dudes, of course, but they're Sean structure. Sean Farida. Sean Farida's a fucking He's an freak, animal. dude. It's like shorter than me. I didn't even know that was possible. If, <laughs> if Sean Farida was uh, three inches taller, oh, yeah. four inches taller, Tough, he'd be right. Mr. Olympia. He literally is a Ronnie Coleman. Literally, the Ronnie Coleman, just shorter. There's no one in history other than Ronnie Coleman who has that much muscle packed on their frame per inch is ridiculous. It is so ridiculous. If he was just a, just taller, he, there, he'd be unbeatable. There'd be no one in the world that can compete with him. No. He just yeah. he's a freak of fucking injury. Yeah. He looks like a, he looks like a balloon. Yeah. I think he. You know what? I thought. I mean, there was talk that he was gonna try. Like he, he did. did. He went to. He, he tried at the Arnold. He, he got what fifth. You got fifth at the Arnold. Yeah, it's just difficult. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, still, the, you, that Arnold was stacked. And he still got fifth. That's crazy. Yeah, he's... Like, the, the, the guy of the earlier era was a guy they called the giant killer, Danny Padilla. And Danny Padilla was about the same size, height-wise, as Sean Clarita. He was dense. And he had a... He, he, he would always be in the top three... Uh, you know, at the O, but he just couldn't, because you put, you know, somebody next to, you know, you put me next to, like, Alex, come on. Yeah, I mean, it's not even... It, it, even if your physique is better, don't get me wrong, they do judge based on three criteria, the, the symmetry, you know, size, muscle, get it. But when you put a dude who is structurally six, six foot, let's say six foot, and they weigh 280 on stage, even if they're not as in, they don't have the best symmetry, and they're set, putting up to Sean Corrida, which is like 5'3". Yeah, I mean, that. It, I mean, it just makes some structural, that's a structural disadvantage. Your eyes are automatically going to go to the other guy. And that sucks. I, I think because pound for pound, I do think Sean Corrida is the best bodybuilder in the world. You've seen his videos where he's in that warehouse? Yo, oh, yes. What is that? Is that like an equipment dealer? I think so. It's an yeah. equipment dealer, right? Yeah. Because okay, it's not even his, his, his uh-huh. YouTube. It's not his YouTube. It's like Sam's fitness, uh-huh. yeah, fitness equipment. <laughs> it was, I saw that. I was like, what the fuck is this? It was, uh, the the, um, the thumbnails for all of the videos look like y'all him deformed and shit. It was funnier and shit. I love, I love watching it. Especially when he's on uh, Iron Mouth or what is it? Uh, Ray, Iron Rage on yeah, uh, Columbus. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I don't really dig him. I, I've never really liked him all he's that such, much. But he's so full of bullshit. that John Romano, another, but you know, I mean, I don't know him, but I just all never, of them just are just so much full of bullshit. Yeah, and but you know, Columbo, yeah, he went, he's gone through a lot of. Oh yeah, he's put in some some shit. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I've seen some of the pictures he had when he was. At his biggest hole, I did. Fuck me, Christ. Yeah. Jesus Christ. That was bad, guy. Yeah, even, I mean, but he could have. If he didn't blow out his stomach, the dude was a mass monster. He was up 300 pounds easily. But, and before he blew out his stomach, he actually had a pretty, pretty decent position. No, he very, 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 very short time span where he looked good, looked big enough to be an IPC pro, and his stomach was fucked. So there's. He could have been, dude. He could have been. He could have been decent. Yeah, if it wasn't for Lee Priestley, we probably have to listen to it. Like, I didn't listen to it for a long time. Dude, that, have you listened to some of his stories? Lee Priestley's stories? Oh, man, that dude is <laughs> fucked up. He has had a messed up life. Holy oh, shit. I haven't heard it. I haven't heard anything ooh, about ooh, his, ooh. Like, when he was a youngster? No. Oh, when he got when to be he a little was, older? He was like, when oh. it, dude, <laughs> just, just YouTube some of like Lee Priestley's crazy stories. Dude's fucked up in the head. When he, I, he was already fucked up in the head to begin with as a bodybuilder, but he's ultimately fucked up in the head as a person, too. He's, he's rough. He's rough. Like, I'd be scared to hang out with him. Like, I'd kind of scare him. He's, yeah, he, he told it. I've heard a couple of his stories. But, you know, I mean, you consider, too, like, what was going on at that time, recreationally, you oh, know. Yeah. It was like, come on, man. You, you might be lifting and all that, but I'm sure that you had your moments. I mean... 
you're still a young man. Well, and back, back then, bodybuilders had bodybuilders only had eyes on them when the Olympia came around. Okay, we didn't have like they didn't have social media, they didn't have YouTube, so they only had eyes on them during that single time of the Olympia. Well, nowadays guys have to almost stay in shape. Not like, of course, they get into the full policies, but they have to keep it toned down, keep the body weight. Body fat toned down, and their lives relatively squeak clean because of social media. Everybody can exactly. see you. We well, we'll all have cameras. Back then, you, had, you had like Kevin LeBron that uh-huh. for six months out of the year, he looked like he didn't even work out. Uh huh. That was weird. Huh? Yeah, he would just literally just not work out. He didn't care. And he would take his full ass off season. I'm not going to work out at all. And then when it's time to start getting start getting shit, I'm going to start working out again. Then I don't know how the fuck you gain 80 pounds of fucking muscle in six months and then cut down. Pat was him. like that too. Who? And Pat Matsuda. He was like that because I asked him. See, me and my buddy, we said, he did his first contest. I don't know where it was. And we said, hey, when you get done, you do with your prep and you do your show. Me and my training partner, uh, Scott, uh, we'll take you out for dinner. Oh, okay. You know? And uh, so. He, uh, and I, so I got to know him and, uh, a little bit there, and I asked him, you know, about him, like, yeah, I don't really like doing this, but, you know, when there's a competition, you know, I'll come in here, and otherwise, you'll see me in here, I'll fool around, and then I'll be gone, and, you know, and then he did a lot of, like, before it was called MMA, he did some, a lot of martial arts stuff, too. Oh, no shit. Yeah, he was short like me, but he was, like, 180, so he, like when he was, he was big, he was about 180 pounds. He was, a, he was crazy. You know? oh, shit. And he had that, he was like an Islander guy. I don't remember if he was Samoan or I, I don't know, but he had that skin tone that you didn't really have to like do anything, right. you know? And uh, yeah, he was, he would come in and he was an animal, you know? He had some monsters back then, huh? Yeah, there, yeah, because you know, it's his strength and health. And then, you know, Golds was a little more mainstream by then. You know, there was more, uh, more ladies coming in and more bodybuilding because Golds from back up for the, you know. And so, um, like now, uh, I don't even know all the places that, that are just straight powerlifting. You got, you know, or predominantly, not straight, but yeah, predominantly. Yeah, yeah mass, that yeah. Head. Yeah, a couple other good places here in town. I think you told me about the hit. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he, he did. Because uh, I, I think we talked about the corner. I didn't even <laughs> heard of that place. But, oh, man, there's so many different things here in town now. So it's really, and it always really was kind of, you know, it's always been popular, but, the, but combined Bakersfield and Kern County with, yeah, because we're still kind of, you know, people, work, people still work in ag, they still work in the oil field, yeah. I can tell you stories about the oil field in the 80s, it, you know, so the late 70s. Ain't nothing like, I mean, we're all throwing chains, you know, oh, and they're swacked and broken, and, you know, it's well, that's different. Thing, that's the thing I always, always joked around about Bakersfield, uh, even when I was even when I was in high school. Like, you were, there's three things you can do in Bakersfield when you're out of work. You can drink, do drugs, go to the gym. It's four, three big things you do in Bakersfield. Pretty much. Yeah, that's in the, now, nowadays, before it was fitness was or just powerlifting, bodybuilding in general. You had a decent amount of people doing it. Um, the, the group was real tight because we, everybody knew each other. Because if you were really, like, you were in the shit, you were all training together or at least helping each other out. Yeah. Now it's just fucking everybody and their mother thinks they're bodybuilding now. But which is again a good thing because it makes everything mainstream. It brings attention to the sport. That brings money to the sport. It's awesome. It's, I, don't get me wrong. I love it. Plus, it's good for you as long as you, can, you know, as long as you keep your mind right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's and that's the thing. That's the whole thing. It's, when it gets popular, it doesn't just bring good to the sport. It brings a whole bunch of bunch of bullshit to the sport as well. And like before, I mean, I before these guys talked me into it, I didn't have social media ever. I never had an Instagram. I never had um, Facebook. I never had anything off ever and well uh, not then that was the whole reason was for that is because i just wanted to sit with bullshit didn't want to do it didn't want to even that's deal smart. with it yeah i just did it very smart and i think growing up throughout high school growing up throughout college it actually 
kept me out of a lot of fucking trouble. And it just made my life a hell of a lot less stressful than it needed to be. Yeah, people compare themselves. Like, I can't compare myself with people that are half my age. But, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean you don't go in there and try to do your best. Yeah. And, and you got ideas. And, you know, you can tell that, you know, what you're doing is effective for, for the most part. But everybody compares. Like, and I never got that concept. I knew that you know what you're talking about because I've had buddies and I've had my girlfriend mm-hmm. explain to me what they felt comparing themselves to other people. Oh, man. It's uh, what, they're do, what they're doing and how they're, like, they don't understand what... That why they can't, they're not getting the results as other people are, these hundreds of thousands of other people are that they're sitting on, on Instagram, and I never got that concept. I'm like, why? Why are you even, why does, what do you give a fuck? But I never had it, so I can't, I can't judge them for it. And it's like that, but I feel, I really feel like, in America especially, that we really do the ladies terrible disservice. You know, when ladies get to be in the 40s, you know, you gotta be extra special something to keep your name, and I just think it's wrong. And, oh, yeah, it's you know, it gives them such a short, and they're not even lifting, or they're just living life, you yeah. know, and they feel like, oh, I gotta live like that, but you don't have the genetics for that. Yeah, you, know you, know? you can't help that. Why stress about that? Yeah, about that? but it's, you know, and it's social media has a lot. Like I said the other day, I was looking at politics, and I almost took my phone and just, Throw it on the floor because I'm like, oh man, you guys like that's a real good thing, you know. But it's kind of what we're we'll dealing with here at this point in time. Oh, yeah. Fuck yeah, you know. But and you know, use it. But the people that are smart, they use it to their advantage. It's a marketing right. tool. Oh yeah, right. exactly what it is, and it's good for that. Oh hell yeah, you, you, know? can, you can be that person that that gets underneath their skin and then be like, fuck no, that's never happening to me again, or. I'm going to be better than that person that you're trying to be better. Compare yourself to. Or you have that person just that holds. Yeah. I mean, but it was cool to be able to see all the pictures and stuff, you know, they, in Reno. Oh, uh, fuck yeah. Because they had it. Like, I don't even, I don't know if I watched, looked at as many for the Cal, but Reno, I looked at a lot of photos, you know. No, cool. the Reno, they posted all their photos. Yeah, it was, they did a good job. I like, I really like how Center Podium does their competitions. They, it they, was good. They really do do a really good fucking job. Everything about the muscle contest versus the Center Podium, everything about it, I liked Center Podium better. They just take so much more time and effort to their athletes and the, the whole presentation of the show. How was it backstage, you know? Over at, uh, over at the uh, uh, Reno. Cal or Reno? Reno. 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 I could kind of imagine the Cal, it was, you know, but yeah. Reno. Yeah, Reno was actually pretty cool. It was very, very small, but it was very extremely organized. They had everybody calling out in different directions. Uh, everybody was knew exactly where they needed to be at. The people backstage organizing everybody and directing everybody, they're super nice. The girls back there that were uh, touching us all up for the uh, spray tan mm-hmm. uh, the glaze, super awesome, super helpful. Uh, at, the, at the muscle contest, it was the exact opposite. There's guys yelling for numbers and trying to figure out what the fuck's going on. And I didn't fucking even know I wasn't being, I wasn't doing my 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 posing routine until ten seconds for about I was about to go on, but. It was. I'm 100% going to be doing center podium shows from now. I just, I love it. Even though they're a little bit, a little bit smaller, and don't get me wrong, I will be doing. If it's a big show, I'm, I'm going to do it, even if it is a muscle contest. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but for just like shows, just to qualify for nationals, center podium is shit. The guy Chris who runs it's fucking awesome. Yeah. The he's directly in line with the production. I mean, he's up there the whole fucking time. He loves it. He just likes putting on a show for people. And he takes care of his athletes. And it's fucking awesome. I'll never forget that. Face the curtain. That was so <laughs> and fucking I, cool. At first, I couldn't even... I thought, the curtain's over here? And it was the actual, you know, where they had the kind of the graphics. Yeah. The, and I thought, it took me about... It took me forever to really figure, oh, that's what he's talking about. And the, the, <laughs> the, the, him, them bringing out Brian Ainsley for guest posing and that little kid. Oh, that was so fucking it cool. So nice. And then they brought out... Every single one of the uh, competitors to do that big ass group shot with everybody—that's awesome. That is awesome. They didn't have to do that. That was just a pain in the ass for them, but it was something they did for the audience. It was super fucking cool. Yeah, we saw him at the uh, 
some place where I ate, um, and oh, you know, it was just it was so nice. You know, oh, I, dude, hey, so thank nice. you for showing up, and oh no, it's my pleasure. You know. Yeah, me, cool. meeting him while I was uh, naked tanning that was that was a weird. I didn't think that was going to happen. I did not wake up that morning expecting I was, that was how I was going to meet for young Ainsley. They get tanned because they didn't have any more socks on. That was great. Right. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then being just like trying to get his signature with my backpack. I'm just fucking butt ass naked. I'm like, can you show my backpack? And he's just like, what the fuck, dude, sure. <laughs> Are you okay? He was, I was, He's cool about it. He didn't yeah. give a fuck. Yeah, that was a good show. Backstage, right? we talked to him for a while. They're talking about a good 30 minutes while we were all back there trying to pump up. And um, he was super cool. He was talking to everybody back there. He was talking to the kid. Um, he was just chilling. Yeah, he was. He was just. Yeah, he really was chill. Yeah. I was like, all right. You know, you always want to see the people that are, you know, supposed to be at a higher level. And you want to be. You don't want them to be just like, you know, like yeah. something that they feel like they need to do, have to do, yeah. or something like that. Like really, really into uh, it. When, really we're, into when we were at um, at the Cali Pro, we were, I went to go. I talked to Chris Acido, uh, the coach, mm -hmm. and he was super cool. He took a picture of me. I talked to um, Stu Sutherland, super nice dude. Talked to him while I was about to get my photo of my uh, second go to Tannin. He just shot the shit with me for a while. Um, Manny was going to try to say hi to Sergio Lima Jr. before he almost disintegrated that motherfucker's jawline. Yeah, that was. I just, Manny, Manny comes up to me, he's like, should I go take a picture of him? Yeah, man, he's right, he's right over there, just go ask him for a picture. And I just like, I said, hold, hold up, wait a second. Wait, hold up, stay over here for a second. Because I saw him get like, you know like, that, those mannerisms when a man's talking to another man, and you can just tell that that's going downhill real fast? Yeah, and I, this dude looked like, he, he didn't even look like he was from the show. The guy was like, maybe a way to buck at you. And I, he was talking to Stuart Jr. Jr. And I was just, man, just hold up here for a second. Like two seconds, like five seconds later, this surgery leader just goes off on him. Just like, I thought he was winding up a punch, but he just, like, points off the direction and says, get the fuck out of here. I'm like, oh, oh shit. shit. I thought he was going to kill this motherfucker. And I was like, ah, oh, man, let's, let's hold off. <laughs> I don't think he's in the mood right now. Yeah. I, I don't. It's so hard to tell because you don't know exactly what's been going on. Exactly. But I think he was upset too because this place is like, when I heard his name, I thought, dude, like, I didn't even, like, there's some of those cats I don't even know of. You know? I know but that he, he was dealing with a lot with the whole rest in, um, in Dubai. I don't know if you know about that. Uh -huh. uh, there was like, there's a, um, he had an accident, that a car accident that wasn't his fault. But it ended up killing another person, um, and because of the laws there, he because he was involved with the accident, he was held there yeah, until the whole investigation was done. That's why he had to miss the uh, South American South American uh, Arnold South, yes, Arnold South America. But he was going to compete in Arnold South America, and he was more than likely going to win that show. But uh, because of that whole thing, he had to stay there. And then the Cali Pro, literally, he flew from Dubai to the Cali Pro um, 48 hours before that show happened. So he had a, this long ass. Kind of interrupted his prep there, right? Dude, seriously. <laughs> so he got, he prepped for the Arnold, had to hold that conditioning for like three weeks, and then decided to do the Cali out of nowhere, and then fly. And I don't, I don't know if you know this, but flying. Fucks with your body's water weight like a motherfucker. Yeah, you said that yeah. out here one day. Fucks you up. I would rather drive anywhere than go fly because of how much it fucks with your water. And he just, he just, this last minute, it's not like he could peak, right? It takes days to peak. So I think that's what he's told. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, I probably wouldn't, if I was him, probably would have just waited to compete at another show. But he wanted to, I mean, he looked, he looked decent, especially for not being on stage for like two or three years. He looked pretty damn good. But there's no one way in hell he was going to be Ross. So that guy that wanted to, that went up to him, didn't know, tell him what kind of question he I asked him. Exactly. You know, I mean, so you kind of, I mean, you go, oh, well, that ain't good. Yeah, but you don't know what he, you know, yeah. he's just trying to get, 
behind him and compete and do the best he can. He knows he's not a tip top. Right. And then so he comes in and some starts asshole comes poking in and say, Exactly. I mean, and you, I mean, me and you both know fall and bodybuilding. Sergio Leon really Jr. doesn't really have the best composure when talking about emotions. I mean, he's, he's always on Instagram or something talking shit. But, um, yeah, it was, it was, other than, I wish I could have shot, saw the show. Because I still have never been to, never seen a pro show. So I wish I would have fucking saw, like, all the top competitors. That would have been really cool. So I think we're, this sometime this year, we're going to go down to another pro show. And if I talk him into it, go to, go to fucking Orlando and see the go to Olympia. That'd be badass. All of us fly down to Olympia. You've been to the expo before, right? I've been to the expo. Yeah, yeah. the expo is sick. Bro. It was crazy, man. Everybody that I mean, older Flex Wheeler. Did you know Flex? He just lives in Fresno. That's where yeah. he grew up. And I seen him train here at Twenty Four Hour Fitness. Oh no before. shit! Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I asked. As a matter of fact, I thought I knew who he was. There was nobody really bugging him or anything. I'll never forget. And I go, damn, man, that's that's a man really? right there. Yeah. And uh, he. On the leg press machine, and when you was know, this? he was kicking. Oh hell, I don't know, in the 90s. Oh, so it was when he was like, yeah, he was like, oh no, so in yeah, the he was training. Career. I mean, he was all covered up, but he was training, you know. And so oh, when I went bad. to 